Welcome to TFPIE. I will try not to steal too much of your time, uh, but for people who don't know about what TFPIE is, um, just a few words about that. So it's an um, international workshop um, on trends in functional programming in education um, that was started with, by Marco Moazen and myself. And basically it's, re it's really supposed to be a workshop in which people who are interested in any aspects of teaching functional programming can meet and discuss and exchange ideas. And please note, this is not restricted to academia only. Uh, we also welcome people from industry, but also from high school education, anywhere where functional programming is involved. Um, we also have a formal reviewing process that's typically done after the workshop, in which the um, present presenters are invited to submit uh, to a formal uh, publication that will be judged by a program committee and we publish our proceedings at EPTCS. We have a wiki where you can find more information. Um, the other thing I really uh, am actually quite proud of is that we uh, have the 10th anniversary already. Uh, here you see the list of the previous venues and the chairs that organized these events. Uh, so once again, big thanks to these people and the presenters at these uh, sessions. Uh, for today, I think um, the program committee and the speakers uh, established a very interesting program. Here you see a brief highlight of all the speakers of today. Um, the program is also obviously on the Lender Days page, so uh, I invite you to have a look um, at uh, these very nice uh, talks that we're going to have. I do realize um, that's well, we, we are online um, and you can see where the speakers are coming from. So what we are trying to establish is to travel around the world. So we pass through 17 time zones. We will have six uh, ordinary presentations, two keynotes. So it's very, it's a very tight schedule, but also very interesting. So uh, please, um, I, I hope that you can uh, attend all of them, but it's uh, very clear that it's going to be a challenge for everybody. Um, but the most important thing for this moment is um, to introduce the first keynote lecture. And I am absolutely thrilled that Francesco Cesarini and Simon Thompson have agreed to give this keynote. I think it's super um, applicable for this audience, both Lambda Days, TFPIE, uh, in which they are going to play out uh, industry versus academia and share their insights. So Francesco Cesarini is known as the founder of Erlang Solutions. He's also a lecturer at the University of Oxford and has uh, authored a number of books, one of uh, together with Simon Thompson, Erlang Programming, and Simon Thompson is an uh, emeritus professor at the University of Kent, but also honorary doctor and professor at Jotfors Laurent University, um, well-known author of the Craft of Functional Programming book series. Um, but you might also know him for his work on refactoring tools for various functional programming languages. Uh, he's also a developer of MOOCs, and I know he's very passionate about teaching functional programming in general. So now I am going to stop my screen sharing and I hope that I can give the floor to Simon and Francesco. Please go ahead. Oh, by the way, one final note uh, for questions. Um, please enter your questions in the Q&A block. Upvote if you like. We will answer Simon and Th Francesco will answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, Peter, thank you very much uh, for inviting us. Um, I think it was, um, I've cooperated with Simon for many, many years. And uh, I think the interesting part with kind of pairing us together is that I started my, my, my career kind of in the industry um, and then transitioned over to academia. And I think Simon did the opposite. I think he started off in academia 
and then you know made his transition over over to the industry itself. And, yeah. So over so, to sorry. Yeah. No. No worries. <laughs> so um, you know, I, just to give you my background, this is me, and this was the picture on my very very first uh, security badge at Ericsson. A uh, similar haircut to what I have right now. Uh, back then, is it was because I was a student and I got my uh, you know, ten pound haircut once every two months. Right now, we're in lockdown here in London. I cannot get a haircut, but yeah, I, there's, there's you know, many have pointed out there are quite a few similarities. But yeah, this was uh, my first badge at Ericsson, and it was at Ericsson where I actually taught my first course. Um, the year was uh, 1998. Uh, Erling had not been released as open source, and at the time it was mainly used within Ericsson. What does that mean? Uh, it meant that if you wanted to work with Eric's, with Erling, so me and you know, um, many of my colleagues at the time, uh, you had to work at Ericsson. And if you worked at Ericsson, it was very, very likely you got pulled into an Erling project because it was, yeah, it was being spread and used in a lot of key term projects at the time. And my, my, my first opportunity to teach, uh, I taught not because I was really interested in teaching. I'd never done it before. And honestly, between you and me, uh, just don't tell anyone else, I, I thought I was going to be pretty bad at it. Uh, uh, the only reason I accepted you know, to teach a course is that I had the opportunity to travel to the States, uh, visit Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. So it's, it's the area between Chapel, Durham, and uh, Raleigh. It was a great, you know, it was one of the top 10 places uh, to live in in the States when it came to quality of life. And en route you know, to visiting North Carolina, I was planning on stopping in Philadelphia and DC to visit friends. And yeah, I, I really had no experience in teaching. I had not taken any training and didn't think it was for me. And Monday morning, suit and tie, uh, walk into the classroom and quickly realized that I had a class which did not want to be there. Uh, they were not interested in learning yet another proprietary language uh, they could not put on their CV. And you know, throughout that week, you know, they kept on finding issues with the training material, with the language and anything, with the Erlang programming language, and anything they could actually go in and criticize. Uh, so at one point, we were pointing out a spelling error on slide 121. You know, I'd go in and reply, it was British spelling. So very quickly, they countered by questioning why in slide 109, uh, I, you know, we were using American spelling, and I think you know, the highlight of that week was when a student stormed to the whiteboard and implemented an object, uh, instantiated it, and then called the method hello world, uh, and then, then pointed to this and said it was intuitive. Um, so yeah, it was basically this much code uh, in Java, uh, it was a hello world in Java. And uh, I went in and replied, I, I went up to the whiteboard, you know, to, to, to the mark, and did IO format, Hello world, so module function arguments. And you know, I looked at one line compared to you know, the code he had written and says, this is intuitive to me, you know, what's the problem? And I basically had three weeks in North Carolina where I ended up turning that class around. Uh, yeah, I, I was young, energetic, a lot of adrenaline. I really uh, for airline was you know, one of the top languages at the time. So when I, when I got returned um, back to Sweden, I, I basically ended up getting one of the highest grades, at, uh, the highest, sorry, not one of the highest, the highest grade a trainer at Ireland Systems had ever received. Uh, I, I, it was be, I managed to beat all my experienced colleagues. And, you know, I'm not quite sure what was wrong with the class at the time, but I suspect, you know, that had such a traumatic experience learning Java, they probably thought that learning any other language would just be as bad. Now, when I learned Erlang myself, it wasn't traumatic, it wasn't hard, it was easy. You know, we didn't even have lectures. The, tra uh, the, 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 the lecturer came in and said, you know, this is the book, read it, these are the exercises, do them. And then off they went and, you know, lectured about the horrors of parallel programming. And I suspect, you know, it was so easy to pick up because the second programming language I taught in university was ML. So, um, you know, whilst, you know, you know, 2003, um, Thomas Arts asked me to teach his second year students at the IT Institute of Gothenburg. Again, warning signs, the only language in knew was Java, but again, you know, very successful course. I had over 700 students there. Um, the very first year I taught with John Hughes, a very mature student called, uh, sorry, the first year I taught at the IT University in Gothenburg, a mature student called John Hughes snuck into the course and, uh, and, and yeah, was, was there asking all the hard questions. Um, 
And yeah, it was uh, the last 10 years uh, I've been teaching a current program course for industrial master students at Oxford University. And very different there, actually use Aaron as a tool to explain the principles of the current programming. So this was me, you know, Simon, what were you doing uh, back in the mid to late 90s? How did you get into teaching? I mean, let's go back to the mid 80s um, and show our age. I was still in high school, yes. <laughs> I got into um, functional programming after working in mathematical logic and thinking I love this, but I'd like to do something where you know, it's, it, it has a more immediate impact. Um, perhaps functional programming didn't, but that's another another question. But so moved to Kent and worked with David Turner and got after getting really excited about um, about the whole area. And, you know, it was the 80s were a time when people were very excited about functional programming. Um, and I had PhD students, one of whom was Raphael Linz, who I'm, I'm sure a number of you will know. Um, so Raphael was from Recife in Pernambuco in Brazil. And I was lucky enough to spend the first half of 1988 um, teaching at UFPE in, in Brazil. And I just wanted to share my teaching experience from there. So I taught functional programming in uh, SML um, and taught you know, a lot of the standard things. Certainly none of the people I was teaching, none of the staff had PCs. So this was teaching on the mainframe. And that meant you know, it, was, it was a rather narrow um, rather narrow interface. There was lots of, of doing things with um, with characters and numbers and so on. But, you know, the principles are there. The other really striking thing, which you know, I, I think we're still thinking about when we think about education and computer science in general, was the fact that the class was split 50-50 between men and women. There was no there was no gender distinction. And I'm sure that was related. I mean, people talk about this, um, but I'm sure that was related pretty strongly to the fact that computers were not in the home, they'd not been taken over by boys to play games or whatever. They were just these things that existed in larger institutions. And it didn't matter what gender you were, you programmed. Um, and that was really quite, quite uh, refreshing. I mean, it was, a, it was a great year for me, a great half year. The other thing I did there was teach a course on Martin Love type theory, which was the, the beginning of my first book in on type theory and functional programming. So again, that was you know, exposing that to people to that a long time before it was it was common knowledge. But you know, these ideas have been around for quite a long time. So I think that gives you a picture of where I've been coming from. And you know, the 80s were perhaps a high point, and you know, we're at, clearly at another high point for functional programming. Um, and some of us have been keeping the faith that, that whole time. But let's I'll hand back to Francesco now and um, talk yeah. to him about things we did together so you know uh, going back a few years i don't exactly remember how long ago that was but i was invited to the university of kent uh, uh, to give a lecture uh, to, to the students who at the time were learning haskell uh, they were giving um uh, olaf the lecturer you know, a very very hard time uh, why do we need to learn functional programming why is it so important so he, he went in and explicitly asked me to give him a lecture of how Erlang was being used in the real world. So uh, how functional programming was affecting our day-to-day -day lives. And so there, off I go, I started off with WhatsApp, you know, sending messages, how, you know, whenever they called their grandmothers from the UK up to Scotland, it would be routed through a, a, a network, you know, controlled by Erlang, um, asked how many played massively multi-use online gaming, and, and quite a few were playing Erlang games, uh, uh, games where they had whole backend was in Erlang. Um, ask him how many you know were getting annoying texts with a particular mobile operator, uh, and he explained that it was all Erlang, as well as you've know, got quite a few to admit that they voted on your know, Britain's Got Talent and Big Brother by SMS, uh, and again you know explaining to, you know to, to them how Erlang was actually handling the SMSs but also aggregating the results, and so. You know, very inspiring lecture. And after it, you know, one of the students, he was sitting in the corner, kind of arms crossed. Um, and he, he yeah, asked if anyone has any questions. And he, he, he raises his hand and says, is Air, ask me, is Erlang any good for drawing ASCII art? And I stop, think, and go back and ask, sorry, could you rephrase the question? Uh, I, I, I don't understand what, you know, I don't understand what you mean. And I got met by this 
eerie, strange silence, uh, for a, which lasted about five seconds, after which you know, another of his fellow students um, came in and says, you know, what so-and-so means is that you know, part of our Haskell assignment, we had to draw ASCII art. You've just been telling us how Erlang is being used all around us. You know, we should surely you know, be learning Erlang and not Haskell. The, the, my answer was simple. Uh, you know, you're not here to learn Haskell, you're not here to learn Java or Erlang. You know, the, the industry is moving so quickly that anything you're taught in universities will probably be obsolete by the time you graduate. And, and the fact is you never stop learning. And, you know, what you're doing here is to learn how to learn. You know, Haskell, learning Erlang is going to be, you know, picking up Erlang is going to be easy, but it's not just Erlang you, you're going to pick up. Uh, you know, you'll hopefully have been exposed to concurrent programming languages, logical programming languages, imperative languages, and object-oriented programming languages. And if you've been exposed to this theory, you know, to, 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 the, to this concept, to these paradigms, picking up whatever language, you know, which has not been invented, uh, you know, but, you know, which will become mainstream now in the future, will be fairly, fairly trivial. Just like I picked up airline like that uh, because I knew ML. And, um, you know, I have to say, I've never seen such an expression of relief on yeah, at any of my talks as I did from the front row that day. You know, it was, uh, they would, they would dry their sweat. Uh, and, yeah, and, and you know, after this lecture, uh, quite a few of the students did reach out uh, asking for internships. And they got the answer right. Yeah, we've done Haskell, and I think it would be really, really cool to, 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 to uh, you know, to, 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 to learn Erlang and use it. And the thing is that in universities, students are there to learn how to learn. Okay, so you know, thinking about what we do in, in universities a bit more, I, I, I agree we teach students how to learn, but we do actually teach them, they have to, they have to do, do some functional programming in order to learn what, it, what it's all about. So I think there are these principles, there are lambdas, there are, there are things like immutability and so on, but there are also languages which allow us to embody that. We, 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 we've heard about Haskell, um, we've heard about Erlang, we could use a language like Clojure, or in, I think later this week we're going to hear that we could actually now do our functional programming course in Excel um, and you know, JavaScript and so on. So we could do functional programming in a vast number of languages now. Um, and I think you know, that that's perhaps testament to the fact of, of how successful functional programming has been. And indeed, it, it, it would be a really interesting course, I think, to teach, um, to try and teach a, a, a thoroughgoing functional programming course using something like Java, for example. Um, because then immutability would come through in a much stronger way. We could see the value of immutability in terms of data structures that they share between different threads, for example. So, so getting across what that, that those principles mean in the context of, of a particular language. Um, and I'll say a bit about language choice a bit later on. But I just, I, I think one of the things that perhaps we've missed out on in, in teaching functional programming, and I know this is something that, that, that comes up more than once, it's a question of follow through. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, have the, we have the introduction to functional programming course, we might it might be the first course it might be the um might be a course it might be the first language it might be the second language they might be taught in 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 parallel um i mean we've tried the latter two at kent we never managed to win the functional first argument um and i think i'm inclined now to think the worst option is is the concurrent one i mean i think people need to grasp the set of concepts and grasp the the um the syntax of one language well and then use that as an anchor for learning another. But I think where I've seen people really fly is when we've been able to get some follow through. You know, the, the idea when you're, if you're playing a, a racket sport or something, you, you, uh, you hit the ball hard, you make a sustained shot by making sure you follow through with your racket or your, your golf club or whatever. And I think just a, a recent experience I had, um, very, uh, one of the most enjoyable experiences I've had in recent years teaching, was teaching with Scott Owens at Kent, a course in programming language technology, which was end-to-end -end compilers. And what we did was teach that using OCaml. Um, I mean, it, that's what we used, right? Um, and you know, nice language, tight, relatively small, strict. Um, and 
what we saw there were, people, were students who'd been exposed to Erlang, but because they do a, a year in industry, you know, perhaps 18 months, two years before, but they understood the principles of, of, um, of functional programming. And what we did there was say, well, look, here's a compiler written in OCaml. You can take, take code in a small imperative language and turn it into machine code you can run on your, your laptop or whatever. But what you have to do is, is do something substantial with that. And the skills that came with that were not just writing toy programs. They involved students reading quite substantial amounts of code. They involve extending, in, in, in embedding new ideas, and in particular, seeing that learning happen in in a group. We got initially we said students work in a group of whatever size, but we discovered the key, the ideal size for that was teaching in groups of two. And the students, because doing pair programming in that context, both of them understanding a new language, new concepts, were able to supercharge that and really move at pace. Um, and, you know, this was even the, you know, we saw some very good students, really shiny, but we saw some students who'd in the past struggled and who at the beginning of the course struggled actually beginning to shine because they consolidated. And I think that's, that's something that, um, if we can manage to do that, but I think also manage, I think this is a, equally in a, a, a lesson for industrial courses. I think often, you know, you, you, this, this idea, you go and sit in a room for a week and you've learned a language is, is, you know, somewhat um naive i mean i think you need the follow through and this sort of this sort of extended piece of project work could really do it i've, I've said confer like it's 1999 because i was reminded preparing this that there was a fantastic functional programming language in education conference in, in near nijmegen in 1999 and steve hill and i who was, steve was at kent at the time put in a paper about how what you needed to do was embed functional programming in the curriculum and I think you know it's still it's still a message if you if you can manage to get some sort of follow through that really helps. Okay, one other anecdote, and then I'll move on. What we used to do, and those of you who know my Haskell and Miranda books know, I that I do talk about verification in there, and you know, certainly in the eighties, um, and and people have said a lot about you know functional languages are the obvious languages where you will verify the programs that you write. It's true, but it's taken quite a while. Um, and we're still not quite there. And indeed, verification in other languages is proceeding apace. But I had we I had a fantastic student who was just really good at this this proof stuff and in, in classes. And he was from Greece. And I said, you know, you're really good at this. And he had the, the most fantastic reply to this. He said, well, we've been doing this for over two millennia. You know, we know what proof is about. Um, and he certainly did. And I guess he'd learned about proof in 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 high school. OK, so back to Francesco and uh, to say something more about languages and, and learning style. So, yeah, we, we, we've always taught Erlang, but uh, and what we did in the early days of Elixir is we took our Erlang training material and converted it uh, to Elixir. Um, and the way we used to teach Erlang was you know, we always started with the concepts. We were focusing on pattern matching, on recursion, on concurrency. And these were always kind of the main hurdles uh, the students um, came across when, when picking up Erlang. And what we did in that case is we, we went in and we actually covered them in the first two days of a five-day course. And the remaining you know, three days, uh, we just consolidated on this knowledge. We kept on you know, building on these concepts and we started tying them together, explaining how to build system which never failed. And you know, in in uh, the twenty years of, of you know taking this approach, um, now almost twenty five now, we never had an issue. Uh, we never had any pushback from any of the students, and it worked. You know, they, you know, we've had you know, thousands of students take this course, take this approach, and learning learning that way. Now, that changed um, when we started teaching Elixir with the material we had converted we started getting pushback. And the pushback came not from, much from the students, but actually from the trainers. Uh, you know, trainers, you know, teaching these Alexia courses, um, went in and said, we want to do stuff, you know, we, you know, students want to do stuff. They don't want to learn about the concepts. And so instead of teaching about data types, recursions, funds and I order functions we did in Erlang, we had to go in and completely rework the material. And, you know, if you look at our, 
Elixir course now, the very first thing we do is we start with a higher order function and we show how you can use higher order functions to iterate through lists. Uh, we then go in and explain how funds work and then we go in and we explain data types and then wrap up with the theory behind higher order functions, which is, you know, recursion and how, how you actually go in and recurse on particular structures, encapsulating, uh, you know, the, 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 the changes you apply you know, to all of the elements in, in a fun. And what it was, was you know, very much a typical example of, you know, top-down versus bottom-up approaches. In the airline world, our, our, you know, we've always solved the hard problems first. Um, because you know, for the simple reason that if we failed to solve the hard problems, there's no point in continuing with the project. You know, uh, If you're going to fail, you want to fail early. Uh, and uh, yeah, and you, you don't want to make mistakes in production. You, know, you want to make them with prototyping. And, and that was very much an ethos-centered approach we took. You know, we had prototypes of proof of concepts, which we then use as go, no go decisions. Um, but you know, that was very, very different from the Elixir space, even though it was the same ecosystem. Uh, uh, not all, but I think a large part of the community in the early days came from a user interface, user experience background. And you know, they were coming uh, to Elixir because of a killer, killer app called uh, Phoenix which is kind of the, the uh, you know, modern day Ruby on Rails. And as a result of this, you know, they needed a top-down approach. Uh, they needed an approach you know, based on libraries, based on dependencies, frameworks, and tooling, which would allow the developers you know, to get on with their jobs. Uh, and what, what we mean by getting on with their jobs here in this particular case is the need to visualize. If you're working with UI UX, you need to be able to see what it is you're doing. And that by default means getting something working end to end. And so, you know, whilst these, you know, whilst, you know, top down and bottom up are interchangeable, even with Erlang and Elixir, uh, you know, they're, they're not programming language dependent. Uh, you know, top down versus bottom up is, in my experience, very much steered based on the actual problems you're trying to solve with these particular programming languages. And now, Simon, over to you. I mean, what do you think about kind of language choices and approaches to teaching them? Okay, I mean, just to finish on the top down versus bottom up. I mean, I think it's the answer is both, really, isn't it? I mean, that's, that I think having that context and being able to build something big, it sort of relates to my compiler's point that that was the that's the place at which people feel they're really achieving stuff. So, yeah, interesting. Uh, absolutely, and uh, just to add, you know, it's uh, you know, I think we are doing a lot of uh, bottom up uh, development with with Elixir these days. Mm -hmm. Sure. And we've done top-down uh, development with with um, you know with Erlang. So yeah, it, it, it's very much yeah, it's it's not language dependent at all. It's very much dependent on the types of problems you're solving. Yeah, but nonetheless, you still have to choose a language. And uh, Kent, we did yeah. a long time. We taught a long time. We taught Miranda, and then we taught Haskell, and then we had a sort of crisis of conscience and dis and and finished up for sort of. <sighs> slightly contingent reasons there were too many compulsory courses um too many co compulsory modules that we had to push functional and concurrent programming into one module and we thought well, we could do that in in haskell and occam which is what we'd used before or we could just use erlang as a single language for that and there were some very positive things came out of that i mean just learning one syntax was was uh was great um getting people to to um to a point where they can see how some of the functional programming ideas are used in practice to support what's going on in, in the concurrent space was great. I mean, the one neg big negative about Erlang was the fact we didn't have a type system to help us do development. No great surprise, um, but it really, it did impact. And you know, there were there were errors to do with just the, the <clears throat> rather bizarre notation that Erlang inherited for lists from Prolog that leads students into making you know, perfectly plausible errors to do with turning lists into lists of lists and so on um, that were, were got in their way. Um, so I think there is, you know, we, it's difficult to know. And I think now Kent has moved back to using Haskell and I'm sure students are, are tripping up over other things because no language is, is and no, no real language is that easy to use. And, and I think the point I wanted to make here was not so much a point about um, you know, I think every every real language you choose will have a downside. Um, 
we we used to teach Haskell in hugs, and you know one of the things that that hugs did was um, the way it worked. Because <clears throat> Haskell is layout sensitive. It had a preprocessor that went through and resolved the layout by inserting semicolons in the um, into the code, and then it shoved the code into a parser. So you can imagine, a student on week one writes a an, a program that isn't laid out properly, feeds it in. It's a it's a ten line program or a five line program, and they get back the error message: unexpected semicolon on line four. And student calls teacher over. Where's the semicolon on line four? And of course, there isn't a semicolon on line four. So, the quality of the environment is is crucial. Um, and I think now moving to things like Visual Studio Code with squiggly lines, just giving students environments where the feedback they need is at the place they need it. So having a Haskell where you can easily download it and have it be up and running and have hints and and um, squiggly lines and all these sorts of things really makes a difference. And Erlang has that with a very nice VS Code environment. I know that Haskell is working towards it, but in, in the past, getting good environments for Haskell has been a challenge. And I know, you know, that, that's partly because Haskell's a real language. I, I think a number of us in the community wish for some subsets. You know, we I know there were discussions of this in the past. Having Haskell is such a big language, having subsets, and this is something Racket community have done really well. When you have subsets, you can control feedback from the environment, you can control particularly error messages. That can that can really scaffold students' learning in a way that um, a, just a real off-the-shelf language can't do. But I think tooling in the language server protocol, VS Code is helping is helping a heck of a lot. So things are things are are, are getting there. Um, but you know, it, it's the Erlang experience, just to go back to the point right at the top, the Erlang experience says, yeah, types matter. Um, and, and the dialyzer approach to types isn't quite the one to, that works. I know there are new initiatives on types um, for Erlang, and it'll be very interesting to see where they get. Now, Francesco, why don't you say a bit more about things we've done together? Absolutely. So you know, from my end, I think it started back in 2001, there was an email uh, from you know one of the lecturers at the University of Kent on the Erlang mailing list, and so I responded privately. And uh, um, you know it was at a time when you know the very very early days of Erlang solutions. I was living in London at the time, and yeah, I was using the royal we, even though it was only me within the company. But always make him think that you're bigger than what you actually are. And I came down um, to the University of Kent. Yeah, I met the team. I met, uh, you know, her, you know, heard all about you know the really really exciting research happening there. And you know, once I was really interested, I realized that you know the research was all focused around programming languages and actually not on how we're we're doing things in the industry. So you know, the first thing which kind of went in the back of my mind was, you know, if your research has to have you know ha has to you know, be applicable in the industry, I think you need to better understand our approaches and how we do things. But also, um, yeah, but also, you know, I think um, on top of understanding how we do things, uh, understanding where you can go in and cut corners, uh, you know, so, you know, focus on, on, on things where, which we really think are, are, are a problem. So a few weeks later, uh, after having first come down, uh, I was back on a train, I uh, went to Canterbury, and, and I gave a, a one-day tutorial on OTP. So for those of you who don't know it, OTP is the middleware, which we use to develop Erlang systems. Uh, um, it, it hides, uh, yeah, it consists of, it hides all of the concurrency aspects, supervision trees, built-in fault tolerance, and scalability. And I think you know, th th these two visits uh, resulted in a cooperation, which you know, still today is really, really strong. Uh, you know, we worked on you know, multiple, um, research projects, EPSRC and FP7, so EU-funded projects, uh, a book together in 2009, uh, which we co-authored. And I think it was 2011, correct me if I'm wrong, Simon, when we went from being offline to being online. Um, Simon and I, have, having authored you know, early programming, we did our master classes with O'Reilly. Uh, and it was our first experience in a recording studio, uh, resulted in about four hours of videos. And more or less at the same time, you know, we also started the KTP uh, around e-learning. So, you know, how do we bring Ireland to the masses? Okay, so this was a UK government supported thing to try and get help universities and, and um, companies to work together. 
Um, and what we did was was look at Erlang Solutions, um, Erlang training materials, and try and build an online version of those. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of the technology a bit further down the line. But that was our first introduction. And here's 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 the auto cue, which if you can read it, is has some Erlang stuff on the screen. So I was able to <coughs> use that to to look straight at the camera while we were doing these these recordings. Um, and we got, you know, we we found that was a very useful um, a useful experience as francesco said but how did it work out for you francesco from your company perspective i i think you know it was ahead of its time it was a great learning experience uh but i think you know in, in the development itself we made mistakes such as forking moodle um you know we mess up the prices you know without understanding the target audience and we were marketing it to an audience we weren't used to reaching out to so you know kind of end consumers so you know, we should have definitely, you know, here in retrospective, you know, taken a feedback intensive, you know, top-down approach when we're teaching, you know, focusing on the end solutions uh, and not on the theory. So, you know, focusing basically on getting the stuff done. But, you know, it, it, it's easy you know, to, 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 you know, you know, to be wise, uh, you know, once you know the results. But, yeah, I mean, the project itself was great. It was really successful. And, you know, considering... Um, the tooling uh, available at the time uh, and approaches, you know, I think we were first you know, right then beginning to, to, to explore the whole interactive online environment, even though, again, it was very, very early days and there was very, very little, which we had, you know, we had to build everything from scratch ourselves. But it's it's good to see one of the questions coming out, how will industry and academia cooperate to help lifelong learners? And I think this was our next step, that what we did, the University of Kent was, was going to be 50 in 2015, and it said, it puts it made some <clears throat> cash available for people to do kind of wacky ideas of things that might affect the next 50 years um they call them beacon projects um and we got some funding to do online learning and, and and this was with with um with francesco and and um and with joe as well it was it was a great pleasure to to spend some time doing this work with joe and what we did there was build some master classes and then we turned these into MOOCs. So this one way that industry and academia can cooperate, just to reply to a question that I saw on the on the channel, is, is building things like this. So building online learning. Um, this turned into two MOOCs, one on functional and one on concurrent programming in Erlang. Um, and those are available on the Future Learn platform, which is a it's a UK-based platform that comes out of the Open University, which as some of you based in the UK will know, has been doing online television and radio based teaching since the mid 1960s so there are you know this is one way that that lifelong learners get get substantial support in the uk um even though it's they've been having problems because of the way student finance works these days uh, but it's still one of the great successes of, of uk um, academic media initiatives i think and that what that does is give us reach and it gives us volume you can see that about eight and a half thousand people have been in, enrolled in the functional programming course um in something like 120 countries so if i visit somewhere i have you know, i've visited the south america uh argentina and i met a number of people who'd who'd followed this course and there's no way they could have gone to a an in-person course um i just because of distance distance restraints and 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 cost restraints so these things are um these things make materials available to people who would not have been able to access them in the past. I think there was a, Francesco said earlier on, there was they, ESL didn't know how to price things. I think this is something that the MOOC providers don't understand. Trying to, trying to monetize these things has been a, you know, trying to get enough income from them to ensure the support, the, uh, uh, the con continued support of the platform and to pay for development is a, is an ongoing question, which I think hasn't been, hasn't been resolved. Um, but let me say, you know, just draw a few lessons from this. Um, the first was we, we in, as part of this Beacon project, we got some really key help from, from Mike McCracken, who's at Georgia Tech, which is one of the places in the US that has really pushed MOOC and online learning most heavily. Um, they have a software engineering MSc program and they, a very strong presence-based um, presence-based program and they put that totally online and what was fascinating about that was that they were worried they thought they would cannibalize their their face-to-face -face cohort um these remarks are pre-covid 
they thought they would cannibalize their face-to-face -face cohort. But in fact, what the online did was produce a completely different cohort. Their face-to-face -face people were mainly non-US students who wanted to come to the US and study full time. The online students were nearly all US based, but working and wanting to study to move their careers on. So entirely different. Um, the other thing we learned from this, and I think you know, I, I pass this on if you are thinking of dipping your toe in this water, is, is the role that planning made. Mike made us for each thing that we were to make, a quiz or a, a just a web page or a, a short video, do a lesson plan. Make sure you know what the learning objectives are and make them short. So these typically the videos were five between five and ten minutes long. Short, punchy, one or two learning objectives because getting that right is so much easier and it's so much more engaging to listen to somebody for, for five minutes than it is to, is to listen to them for an hour. Um, so we got a heck of a lot of, of advice from that, just just doing that that elementary planning, which you know I think look, many teachers do as a matter of, of course. I think academic teachers have perhaps been less, uh, plan their work rather less than, than, than teachers in, in schools do. Secondly, we learned um, quite a bit about media technology, I think. In, in recording the masterclasses with Francesco and Joe, we did this in a studio, we had a green screen, we had a really um, you know, wonderful virtual background and so on. But actually, we learned that good enough was, was fine. Good enough technology is fine. I'm doing this with a microphone in my laptop. I think the sound is, is pretty good. Pretty good. The video camera is good. The only thing that you really need is a light. Oh, I'll try and show you my light, but I can't show you. You can see that it's shining on my on my glasses. Having decent lights makes a big difference, and maybe a, a, a better microphone. But apart from that, you're ready to go. One of the things we learned from working with FutureLearn was that their approach is to to try and promote as much as they can social learning. So that what they try and do is to get students to work together. So as a matter of course, when you do one of their, their programs, you will get other students' work to comment on. So I did a course about Brexit, <coughs> or Brexit. Um, and we had to write an essay. And as soon as you've written your essay, you get other people's work to comment on. And that's something we did with the, with the um, Erlang MOOCs. And also, you can get people to comment just in the, in the chat forum. So, so trying to promote that sort of social learning. And I think there's a huge potential for that beyond initial programming. Um, the sort of taking the sort of um, uh, programming language technology course, the, the you know, augment this compiler course, taking that online, so much of the work there is social. It's based on getting people to collaborate on, on shared tasks. But I think in terms of, of um, learning a, a first language or starting off with a language, trying to support it with technology is is crucial and this was something we didn't do with future learn because the platform didn't really support it but in the in the um work we did with francesco taking their materials online we did this is where roberto alloy did some really nice work on taking existing erlang tools like the compiler and dialyzer and the refactoring tool and getting feedback multimodal feedback from those behind the scenes linking them up to Moodle and then presenting that feedback to um, to the participants. Now, of course, in doing that, we recognized that that this wasn't perfect, that we needed to, to um, also to provide manual support, but we did have a, um, we had traditional forums there as well, but we did, it was clear that that was a good path to take. And I think one thing that, I hope will happen to the um, online platforms that we see is that they'll make it easier and easier to to integrate that sort of fine grained learning support. At the moment, FutureLearn allows you to do things like quizzes, but it doesn't have the support for the um, <coughs> for the the uh, for programming exercises. But I suspect that is going to come very quickly. And just you know, a simple perspective here is um, like on on what teachers had to do in that in Roberto's work was we had a, a nice stylized way using an Erlang behavior of describing um, what, what callbacks somebody had to write around, the, um, around their solution to, to support this, this um, automated feedback tool. So that was, a very nice, that was a very nice piece of work. I think, again, it was a bit ahead of its time, and it was quite 
labor intensive so having generic solutions to that i think could make a huge difference i realize that's not so much about functional programming but about about on learn, online learning and i think you know another <clears throat> i think a, a danger that we saw um i mean I, we saw from experience we did at, at kent doing online things and um experiments that we we we've, we've seen from from moocs is that MOOCs are a great, or online learning is a great way of, of teasing out the motivation. The most highly motivated students will will succeed and will get a lot from a, 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 a program. But ways of sustaining motivation of students who are not so motivated is a is a is a key problem. Just a couple more a couple more points. I mean, this was again from Mike McCracken trying to talk about the benefits he saw from the Georgia Tech perspective. Was um, there are some there can be some economic benefits if you open up new markets like the new market they had for their online msc they saw they saw an increase in applications to georgia tech because of their online presence in this area and i think they also <clears throat> they also saw it as a way of increasing the literacy of their um of their faculty and that's something that COVID has done, right? Everybody is now doing a lot more of this, this online teaching and learning, um, and perhaps in, in not in ideal circumstances, but the Georgia Tech program was one which allowed the university to support uh, people to develop those programs. And finally, I'd say we had fun doing it. Um, you know, there are the, there's Roberto and Stephen who were, who were supporting on the project. And just to, to take a random tweet from 2021, um, this is Fellaini saying, I'm just really I just really enjoyed the first live session for psychology of programming. I actually kind it was actually kind of fun. And this is you know, there are there are benefits to this sort of um to this sort of engagement. But now we get um we get to COVID. Um and I think we'll we'll move in a second to to talk with Francesco. I mean just to to um just to backtrack and summarize what the, the last section was very much talking about asynchronous. It was talking about building materials that students come to in their own time, in their own space, and, and interact with asynchronously. Hence the need for online, um, for social me measures, hence the need for technology to support their learning. But Francesco, do you want to say a bit about what you, you've been doing I mean, from, from our end, yes, absolutely. So from our end, you know, Simon's just talking about asynchronous teaching. And from our end, what we've always done is we've done synchronous teaching. Uh, we have instructor-led classes where we could look at the students, we could, uh, you know, we, we could understand the reaction, we could see if they were struggling. Um, it was easy to, you know, to go yeah, behind, the, behind the shoulders and just you know, take a look at the exercises they were doing. And... You know, it was, um, I was on a plane back from uh, New York City on March 14th. A few days earlier, I'd gone from San Francisco to New York. Uh, from San Francisco to New York, I think there were something like 10 of us on the plane. From uh, New York to London, um, it was the very day uh, Trump was shutting down the borders from Europe. There were 48 of us, so the plane was empty. Uh, and you know, we, we, the world was shutting, around, shutting down around us, and it was going into lockdown. And the following week, um, so a week after having you know, returned home, we were supposed to give an in-person course in London. Um, and, and that's where we had to quickly take the decision to pivot and go virtual. You know, we basically had five days to research all of the learning tools, update the material and the curriculum. So Robert Birding and I um, you know, got rocking and uh, we went synchronous in a virtual world. And uh, you know, with, with Eva, our training manager, um, she'd just actually been, kudos to her, she'd been in the office once uh, in 2019, and then you know, joined us uh, you know, a few months later, and never has, has never set foot in the office uh, since they started to work with us. We went in and we tested uh, GoToWebinar, Zoom, Adobe Connect, and you know, whatever, and, and quite a few other of those tools. We had a week to do that. We settled for Zoom, we settled for seven hour days, 50% hand on exercises using uh, breakout rooms where you know, two students sharing screens, uh, cameras on all of the time, names visible, and frequent breaks. And what this gave us was, you know, we, we ended up having the same experience uh, 
in person, um, uh, not the same experience, absolutely not, but the same results uh, teaching in person as, as we did with our virtual courses. Um, I think most notably also the course at Twitter Oxford University went virtual. And I think since teacher, I think we've done it three times at Oxford University. I've had students from Australia, Malaysia, uh, South Africa, um, scattered all across Europe, the United States and Canada, and usually they'd all travel to Oxford to take to take this course. Uh, yeah, and instead, yeah, we've all done it remotely, uh, saving the environment and and saving in on travel time. It's what actually has allowed me to go in and start teaching many more courses, um, you know, than, than what we usually did. So you know, I think you know, we ended up with the same results. Um, but what we do really, really miss is you know, the, the, the in-person aspect. It's going out with the students uh, after a course for beers and pizza and, uh, and, you know, and, and get, get getting them to know them better, even though uh, in, in many cases you know, we do have a virtual uh, kind of meetup you know, during the course where we discuss everything other than the course itself. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's not enough. So you know, I think Everyone who we've taught virtually, we're looking at you know having an in-person meetup when time allows. And and just to say, at Learning Solutions, just in January, I think we had a record of five training courses which went you know which we gave that month. So yeah, you know, that, that that is a lot, and it's much more than what we used to do uh, with in-person courses. Okay, well, I guess what we're doing is moving to um you know we're moving to a point where we we want to conclude, and I think what we wanted to do was say. You know, partly in the in the context of COVID, there's a whole lot <coughs> come up. You know, the whole question of do we want technology or sociability for learning? Do we want synchronous or asynchronous? I mean, are we going pure online or blended? And and I think a huge question, particularly for universities, so for 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 companies as well, is do we want shared resources? Um, or do we do we all want to reinvent things for ourselves? The amount of time that gets spent in every university in the UK, um, putting courses online. Is this the best way of using academics time or should we be should we be finding ways of working together? Should we be thinking of textbooks as, as resources? Um, there's a whole lot of questions that, that circuit now and realize these aren't just about functional programming. Um, so we've perhaps strayed off a bit, but this is, I think you, know, you can see that the industrial and the academic has blended rather. We, we're thinking about ways that people will learn perhaps through their lives, um, and they learn from from you know, in an industrial context and an academic one. Um, so I think, yeah. Francesco. So, yes. Yeah, so so what, what what has really happened, kind of in the industry, is that the coronavirus has forced digital transformation upon us and uh, upon our customers. Uh, so you know, whilst it has done a lot of damage to the world, I think a lot of positives will 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 hopefully emerge. Um, you know, it has showed us that. Uh, we're capable of you know, teaching remote courses, achieve, achieving the you know, same end results. Um, obviously, this is for, for small groups. Um, and moving forward, I really hope it's going to be a hybrid of the two. So travel less, work remotely from beautiful parts of the world, you know, with enhanced productivity and quality of life. I mean, just to give an example, last summer, I spent six weeks with my family working from rural Italy in a medieval hilltop town. And it, Whilst it, you know, it felt like an extended vacation, I did my 40 hours and my productivity was actually much higher than what it is in the office. And you know, this, you know, being there in rural Italy included speaking at meetups around the world and presenting at conferences. Okay, so I think let's, I, that, that's a good point to stop, I think, because we've, we've, we've taken quite a lot of our time. So let's, can we go to questions, Peter? Should we do yes, that? Please, but, but first, uh, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. I'll applaud for everybody uh, audibly, I, I hope. Um, yes, I, I'm not sure if you can both see the questions, but I, I would propose that we, yeah, yeah. we move on from the most popular ones. You can sort them by upvotes. So there's a question by Camilla Rye. So for students in universities without an FP curriculum, how do you convince the university that FP is important to teach? Oh, I... I give a God, I give a lot of guest lectures, and I, I think to quote Simon Peyton Jones, um, concurrent, you know, future concurrent languages will be functional. They might not be called functional, but uh, they're going to be functional. And you need concurrency uh, to program a multi-core architectures, 
and to program distributed systems, which is the future. Uh, every application is, is, is distributed. So, uh, yeah, I, I do this by, by explaining the importance of you know, the features of functional programming languages in concurrency and how, yeah, and, and, and how, you know, they, they adapt. And, you know, giving guest lectures all the time just around this theme, you know, uh, pumping up the students and making them realize the importance of it. Sorry, I just dropped off there. Bad internet, but I think I'm back now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think one thing, there's there's a fantastic paper. Um, so so it called something like Immutability Changes Everything, um, which was in communications to the ACM, which is about why immutability is so important in Java. So I think there are, you can talk about the, the principles of functional programming, about things being declarative, about you know, building different, this, this is about building different versions of a data structure so that different, different threads see a correct version for themselves and that you're not, you're not contending over a, a, a shared resource. So I think, and I think if, if you look at, at something like Java, if you look at any language, you know, why, are, um, why does Java have lambdas? I guess because you can write so much better APIs when you have lambdas in your in your language. You know, you can parameterize whole sets of behavior on on functional behavior. So I think, you know, I think in principle you could, or you could take JavaScript. You could you could take a number of a number of languages and put the the um, the functional programming in there. I remember years ago somebody writing a book, and I, can't, I forgive me for not remembering their name, about doing functional programming in C. I and mean, I think there are those principles apply in lots yeah. of different places. I think so. So I would, I wouldn't be discouraged. I think you can, and I think you know Im immutability. How that works with with concurrency it is is a huge is a hugely important. Um, and it, and in a funny way, it, it reinforces the functional story for people who've learned functional programming as pure functional programming. They can you know they can see how it how it fits with. Um, with the wider context. Okay, Camilla, I hope that answers your question. I see a, a check mark uh, appearing, so I guess it does. <laughs> uh, there's a question from Knezev. Uh, what are the arguments pro against teaching functional first? It's somewhat related. Okay, I think I think the argument of that the argument we had deployed was it was too big a risk, and we weren't. And I think also there were um, the 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 rest of the argue well we're going to teach a lot of our other courses in in java you know we might te net teach networking in java we might teach um operating systems in c and so on so we want we want to have a our lingua franca taught first and then to build on top of that um and I think if I think if that if that's the case, then you can you can use you can leverage that in teaching functional programming. And I think the the argument in favour of functional first is that it's a baseline. Though perhaps this is less true than it used to be. Everybody is starting from the same baseline in that they don't come into the into the course knowing functional programming. So in that yeah. sense, it's it's a leveler. Yeah. Um, so. I. I... You know, one of the challenges I'm facing is OO first, and and again, you know, because you know, different concepts, different approaches, different paradigms help wire your brain in different ways. And I think I when 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 I by the time I take my masters, I sat down and counted all the languages I had been exposed to uh, in university uh, back in Sweden. So it was Umeå University and Uppsala University, and it was over 20 programming languages. So um, I, I slightly disagree with what Simon is saying that uh, that you know you, you want one language to teach the concepts. Um, yeah, well, in our case, that language for us was Pascal, but we had three courses at Pascal, and then everything else, you know, you were expected to pick up these languages, and it you know, and after a while, once you get into that routine, uh, you don't think tw twice about it. You you just do it and you get on with it. You don't complain about syntax. You don't complain about semantics. You know, and, and you, you focus on the semantics because you know syntax sure. is something you should get over in 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 you know, in, 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 in no time. And uh, but, that, but that's not. That, but that isn't the case. You know, I think there's there's research shows that people. One of the problems is people see the syntax yeah. and they don't see the syntax. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time for the syntax to become yeah. invisible. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, but that, that's your job. That, that's the job of the universities. 
-hmm. Well, but but that's why learning, well, okay. I think learning lots of languages is something that universities have moved away from, Um, I think, because because you know learning learning to write hello world in 10 different lang anyway we we, don't, we can't have the speakers yeah. on <laughs> we we need to have we need to have a panel oh yeah we need to have a panel we should have a panel peter <laughs> oh, yeah yeah <laughs> but 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 yeah but 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 just to say you know uh, with, with, with that um i mean I, I was on the stakeholder on the panel at the university of kent and you know simon said oh yeah you'll be happy we're going to start teaching airline Mm. And why are you sacrificing Haskell? You can't sacrifice Haskell. Haskell is as important as Erlang because the two are very complementary to each other. You can't teach them both. Yes, you can. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I, I think it's a good thing. But the issue is it, it, it that completely ignores the follow through. Mm. So the follow through is, the, for me, that's the key. And why people think Java is more worthwhile or C is more worthwhile is that's what you use to teach other things. It becomes a language which is a medium for teaching other things. And what, in moving yeah. to a, func- a model where you use functional for teaching, okay, it's compilers, but it could be could be operating systems. It could be you could use insecurity. You could, so so it, it, that that's there's an implicit message if you have a functional program in Ghetto yeah. and the rest of the, the courses is. Is C your job? No, absolutely it shouldn't be. No, absolutely it shouldn't be a well. Absolutely shouldn't be a ghetto. But you, know, you do functional programming, and once you have the functional programming, learning airline becomes so much easier. I think, sure. and there's a really good uh, comment I think in the chat, which says, "Isn't teaching the, a language the mistake?" Yes, it is. Uh, you know, you should be teaching co- concepts and uh, paradigms because you know, by the time you graduate, right. that language you will hopefully are no yeah. longer be used. Okay, but you can't teach concepts without embodying them. It's like you can't learn to swim by learning fluid dynamics. You've got to get in the pool and you've got to swim up and down. And in order to understand what swimming is about, and in order to understand what functional programming is about, you've got to write programs, I think. You know, so I'm not I'm not the believer in principles. I think and, and this is just this, this, learn that. Yeah. I mean you look you do lots of integrations, you do lots of different and through doing the examples you get an understanding. Yeah. So and, and, and this, this is coming different. from but that's, this is, Yeah. This is coming from the one you know who, who does stuff, you know, and not <laughs> teaches concept, but, but yeah, it, it's uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Fine. for this okay, but for the same time, uh I think we need to close. There are still a couple of very interesting questions. I'm not sure if they will disappear, or I can, would like to invite uh, can I ask, participants. Can I, respond, can I respond to John Hughes's yeah, sure. question about is there a way oh, yeah, of common, sure. common mistakes automatically? I think there's a really interesting piece of work done by Alex Herdis, who's one of, of, of John's colleagues, he, on the Ask L system. Which was looking at ways of um, looking at ways of, of of giving automated feedback to to students based on skeletons, and that looks there was some really nice work came out of that. So John, that would be one place to take a look. I think as a starting point. Um, and there's also some nice work by Lars Orker Fredland who did who used, and this would be dear to your heart, John, who used QuickCheck. As a way of testing Java programs and identified the different sorts of mistakes that people made and managed to build a sort of lattice of those 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 solutions and that was a that again was a nice piece of work seeing how mistakes clustered and so on so that was good sorry but I I'll shut up <laughs> no indeed not <laughs> I would I would like to invite everybody to join in the uh, lounge uh, I'm sure that Simon and Francesco will be seated at one table or another um, and then people can ask their questions uh, I really enjoyed this keynote talk so thank you again very much well thank you for the invitation We've thank you everyone for having us yeah. thanks yeah, you're welcome thanks.